the A-List. It's your chance to vote for the best of Central Indiana. What's your favorite? We wanna know. The A-List. Vote now at theindychannel.com. Good evening, I'm Trisha Shepard. And I'm Todd Wallace, now on 6 News at 7. It's a brand new police department, but tonight at 7, why one third of these police cars shouldn't even be on the street. I'm Jack Reinhardt. The story just ahead on 6 News. A roundabout makeover, the new road that could be getting a major facelift at several intersections. And there they are, the winners of the $314 million Powerball jackpot sold in Indiana. Who they are and the changes they've already made in their lives. From the team on your side, this is 6 News at 7. Don't kick the tires on a Metro Police Cruiser. They might just come right off. That's right. As incredible as it may seem, our 6 News crime investigator has uncovered an aging problem with the department's fleet. In fact, Metro Police has one police car still on the road with nearly 200,000 miles on it. Jack Reinhardt explains why the next time you need the police, take a minute to think about how they'll get there. The motor pool at IMPD, high mileage, high maintenance, an aging fleet in need of far more than a jump scare. Of 107,000, approximately 110,000 miles. I got 148,723 miles on this car. If the city followed its own fleet maintenance guidelines, it would remove one in three police cars from service. Instead of replacing older cars, IMPD has no choice but to repair them. Continuous times to go in for uh, either transmission work or motor work or, uh, you know, front end work mechanically wise. Uh, you know, they, then you take a spare for a little bit and then you get your car back and then have to take it back in. The department puts the average lifespan of a police cruiser at five years or 80,000 miles. IMPD has nearly 600 police cars with more than 100,000 miles and 56 cars with more than 150,000 miles. And whether idle speed or high speed, a ride at the wheel can prove just as dangerous as dealing with a crime in progress. My car has uh, suspension issues also, and if I'm driving at a high rate of speed and hit a bump, it'll throw me into another lane or into a curb or uh, just uh, out of line, and it's, it's very dangerous for us. IMPD will replace fewer than 300 cars this year alone. The state county council had to look at that and you know, appropriate the amount of dollars that they need to so that the officers have the vehicles they need to respond to these emergency situations. The police department has more cars on order, but the reality is that one in three police officers will be driving cars that should have been parked long ago. Downtown Jack Reinhardt, 6 News. And within the last 30 minutes, we received the update from the Metro Police Department. The spokesperson says the chief has requested funding for 600 vehicles and they hope to get them 50 per month. Another Hoosier has died in Iraq. The military has confirmed today 22-year-old Ryan Woodward of Fort Wayne was killed Saturday in Balad. The corporal died after his unit came under small arms fire during combat operations. He was based out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Woodward was a 2003 graduate of Carroll High School. An Indianapolis man has been arrested, accused of murdering his adult son. Police say 69-year-old Charles Long Sr. shot and killed his 40-year-old son, Charles Jr., at the family's home on Harvard Place this morning. Long was on the run eight hours before police spotted his Cadillac on I-465 on the south side. After several hours of questioning, he was arrested for murder. Investigators say there was a party and drinking going on inside the home where the shooting took place. Police are still searching for the gun. A mother says she simply wasn't thinking when she left her two-year-old daughter unattended and unsecured at a friend's home. What happened next landed her in jail, facing neglect of the dependent charges. 27-year-old Ruth Powell told 6 News Today she and her friend left her daughter all alone to go buy groceries. Police say they were gone for at least an hour. A neighbor in the 5200 block of Massachusetts Avenue found the child wandering all alone near the road. I'm praying that I get my, my daughter back, whatever my consequences I have to do, parenting or class, whatever. I want her back. She's all I have. Al is held on $15,000 bond at the Marion County Jail. She does have two other children that she has given up for adoption. 
The winners of the $314 million Powerball jackpot say it was pretty hard to keep it a secret, and they haven't been getting much sleep in the past couple of weeks. The family is from Ohio, and they came forward today to collect those winnings. 65-year-old David Cotterill is retired from General Motors. His two grown children quit their jobs a few days after <laughs> finding out they had that winning ticket. David drove about 45 minutes to buy the ticket in Indiana. He says he has no immediate plans for the money. I don't see anything happening right now. I know the world's going to turn upside down. I enjoy uh, listening to my two children, Lynn and Davy, uh, their dreams, what they want to do, and that's where it's all about right now. Now the family's taking the cash option. That means they'll get just under $146 million up front before taxes. Uh, still not bad. I've got a lot of people <laughs> oh, give them suggestions on, what on to how do to spend it. it. You better believe that. <laughs> Rush hour tends to leave a lot of people feeling like they are driving in circles. Mm -hmm, but believe it or not, that may actually be part of the solution <laughs> on the road to and from Indianapolis. NDOT is studying the idea of putting roundabouts on U.S. 31 from 103rd to 136th streets. It will be years off, but as Ray Cortapassi reports, it's an idea that Carmel officials are driving home. I think a lot of people know what they do, what they actually really do in those things, to yield and that sort of stuff, so they're not really familiar with those things. And so the debate goes round and round again, this time on a different playing field. Last week, the state and Carmel announced a partnership to rebuild Keystone Avenue using roundabouts at major interchanges. Head west now to US 31, where stoplights may also disappear at half a dozen intersections. Using major moves money, roundabouts may become part of INDOT's plan to upgrade the highway to an interstate starting in 2011. Um, it's something that we're taking a look at right now. It's not something that we've used very extensively in Indiana. Of course, it has been used in other states. Carmel officials point to roundabouts that successfully move traffic in other states. In Hamilton County, they say it would not only improve traffic flow north and south, but also east and west. The light timing can really make create problems for them in terms of trying to get across the roadway. Roundabouts are, of course, nothing new here in Hamilton County. Drivers have been getting adjusted to them, especially on the east-west corridors, for some time. But for the ones we're talking about, you have to think bigger, a lot bigger. They look a lot like the ones proposed for Keystone. North-south traffic would go under elevated roundabouts. You'd never use the circle unless you want to turn left or right or cross the road. That could cause fewer high-speed accidents. I can't tell you how many lives we would expect to save every year and how much tragic injury we'll avoid every year. And since it would require purchasing less land than traditional interchanges, it could be cheaper. How much cheaper? Well, considering the whole project is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the jury is still out. In Hamilton County, Ray Cortapassi, 6 News. And still talking about our roads this evening, heading home on Interstate 65 south of Greenwood may be a bit more challenging for the next couple of months. The state has launched a highway project between Greenwood and Whiteland in Johnson County. Some lanes will be restricted while crews patch and pave the roadway. Most of the work will be done during the nighttime hours. That's the good news. The nearly $2 million project should be finished by mid-November. And hopefully most people won't be too bothered by that. Hopefully not. Patience, patience. Yeah. Well, coming up in the news, two sisters died under mysterious circumstances within a matter of days. We have the latest on the investigation and what the prosecutor asked for today. Also ahead, assessing the threat. We're in a long war. We face an enemy that is adaptable, dangerous, and persistent. We'll have a live report on how the top men in charge size up the U.S. government's ability to protect you from another terrorist attack. We'll also check the 6 News gas gauge, find out what experts expect from the gas prices in the weeks ahead. And we'll check the thermometer right now. Trish, temperature's 81 in Indy, but look, cooler air just off to the northwest. We'll talk about making the transition to cooler temperatures coming up. Watch the chase for... This is my testimony. The top U.S. commander in Iraq told lawmakers 30,000 additional troops dispatched to Iraq this year could come home by next July. General David Petraeus made those highly anticipated remarks before Congress today. He also warned further American withdrawals would be premature. This all comes, of course, on the eve of the sixth anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. And today, those in charge of Homeland Security reflected solemnly on our national security. Lindsay Davis joins us now live with why they say keeping the U.S. terror-free for six years has been hard work. Lindsay. 
Hard work is exactly right, and good evening to you, Tricia. On the eve of such a solemn occasion, it is a time not only of reflection, but also evaluation. How safe are we six years later? And more still, are we prepared for another attack? September 11, 2001 is regarded as one of the darkest days in American history. But what it brought to light was a vulnerable nation at great risk for terrorist attack. The fact that we haven't suffered another terrorist attack on our soil in the last six years does say something about the success of our efforts so far. Four agencies charged with the daunting task of keeping America safe participated in a hearing on Capitol Hill Monday where they discussed the U.S. government's ability to detect, disrupt, and deter the threat of terrorist attacks against the U.S. We assess that al-Qaeda is planning to attack the homeland, is likely to continue to, to focus on prominent political, economic, and infrastructure targets with the goal of producing mass casualties. The persistent threat to the U.S. is evident not only by thwarted terrorist attempts, but by reports from a jihadist website that another segment of last week's al-Qaeda tape is about to be released with more from Osama bin Laden and the last testament of one of the 9-11 attackers. We're in a long war. We face an enemy that is adaptable, dangerous, and persistent. In a meeting with New York's Mayor Nancy Pelosi said she welcomed additional security suggestions. The country has a lot to learn from New York. Sadly, the city that takes the biggest hit has learned the most from the tragedy and can be a model to the rest of the country. A recent poll indicates that two-thirds of Americans are worried about the potential for more terrorist threats, but that level matches the lowest in the last six years. Tricia? So, Lindsay, why do the agencies involved here now believe that America is safer now than it was in 2001? Well, that's primarily what they talked about, and the discussion went on for hours. Not only what they still need to do in order to make America safer, but they included among the things that have already worked better intelligence, better tools, and most comprehensively, they talked about the sharing of information between agencies, not only here at home, but also abroad. Thanks very much, Lindsay, for that live report and anniversary that will no doubt make a lot of people uneasy tomorrow. And still talking security here, a security breach involving personal information of Purdue University students. We're going to let you know if you need to double-check your information. Also ahead, three people, including two teenagers, were all killed in a weekend crash. Why their deaths, so though, may spark a change that could save other lives. And is the U.S. heading toward a recession? Why some fear it could be around the corner in neighborhoods all across the country. We'll be right back. At Nationals. Tuesday on Good Morning Indiana, remembering 9-11, how Indy and the rest of Central Indiana will honor those lives lost six years ago. That's tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. Six News continues with Todd Wallace, Trisha Shepard, Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory, and Dave First Sports. The Wayne County prosecutor is asking you to be patient as police investigate the deaths of two Centerville sisters. Police officers found the body of 18-year-old Kelly Stanley at her home Friday morning. Autopsy results were inconclusive. Kelly's sister, 19-year-old Erin, died six days earlier. Her death was ruled a homicide. The county prosecutor today says he needs more time to determine whether a crime was even committed in the latest death. It has been a tough day at North Montgomery High School in Montgomery County. Two students were killed in a weekend crash. 15-year-olds Jenna Smith and Megan Hines were on their way back from Lafayette when they died in a two-car crash at County Road 700 East and State Road 28. An elderly Indianapolis woman also died in that crash. Some students have started a petition drive to have a flashing caution light installed at that intersection. Smith's family says Jenna's cousin was also seriously injured at that same intersection less than two years ago and now agrees it's time something is done. Yes, I think that something should be looked into. I don't know if it's a flasher, I don't know what it is, but something, someone needs to look into that intersection. Tyler Sutton, the 17-year-old driving at the time of the crash, was also injured. His injuries are not life-threatening. 
Purdue University is warning more than 100 students about a security breach involving their personal information. Purdue says the names and social security numbers of 111 students were left on a computer server connected to the Internet. The affected students all took Animal Sciences 102 in the fall of 2004. They will be notified by mail. By the way, there is no indication the information was used illegally. Still, nothing you want to hear about. No, bad news. All right, good news. Gas prices, uh, hopefully they'd be dropping. They are on the rise, though, lately, and there are concerns about a recession. Mm, and the new iPhone has already passed a major milestone. Business Week's Jill Bennett has more on these stories involving your money. Good evening, Todd. Apple sells 1 million iPhones in 74 days. So that's a few weeks ahead of schedule. The announcement comes days after the company cut the price on its first mobile phone by $200 to $399. The iPhone combines a touchscreen phone with an internet browser, also music and video player. Now, Apple says it will sell 10 million of them by the end of next year. To again, check on the numbers. We had some concerns about the economy, but by close, some of those uh, losses falling away here. The Dow higher by just 14 points, 13,127. We had the NASDAQ off by three Three tenths of a percent to 2559. Well, the economy in 2007 is expected to post its worst growth in five years. The biggest risk a recession. A forecast by the National Association for Business Economics expects growth to slow considerably, with 60% of forecasters citing recession as the biggest worry given all of the housing market turmoils. Well, you may gripe about gas prices, but Chicago drivers currently pay the highest prices at the pump, $3.27 a gallon. If you want the cheapest prices in the country, you can head to Newark, New Jersey for $2.52 a gallon. The Lumberg survey of 5,000 stations forecast prices to hold steady in the weeks ahead. Now, around Indianapolis, you'll pay about $3.02 a gallon. Well, age discrimination at work hits the 20-somethings. A new survey by consultant Age Lessons found that younger workers experience age discrimination more often than older workers, at least. That's what they say. Men were also more likely to report it at work than women. That is all for now at the NASDAQ. I'm Business Week reporter Jill Bennett, 6 News. All right, we need to uh, cheer people up after all the negative financial news. The housing market's all getting us down. 73 yes. tomorrow. Does that cheer you yeah, up? 11. Hey, hey love it's it. gorgeous. Great to have you guys here in Indianapolis, Thanks, back in the studio. And, and I know that they're connecting with the community. Tell me about the viewing parties that are going on right now <laughs> in your neighborhoods. Yes. They were talking, we wonder what we talk about during Can commercial you breaks. This? And you were talking Tell about the Ladies neighbors. first. Well, my neighbor came over Saturday talking to my wife, says, hey, Valerie, we're having a viewing party. Pizza Lots of party. pizza. Pe yeah, and I'm like, great. Everyone was checking me out. So if I That's really awesome. messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, guess what? They keep me humble. At least I have more people watching. And my husband's support. out with some of his um, band director teachers. Yeah. He's a musician, so they're they're all uh, watching. So what you're saying is we've got viewers. Thanks for checking. Tonight, at least Thank tonight. you. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll learn more about their, uh, I slipped and said antique auto tour. And of course, uh, Channel 6 viewers remember back in the 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, we had an antique auto tour and then revived that yeah. in the 90s. But they brought something new here in the 21st century, the RV tour. All right, let's hit the beautiful looking <laughs> sunset. We can talk forever, guys. 8.01 is when the sun will set this evening. It's been a great day, although a little bit on the humid side. We'll check out the circle. Not a lot of activity there. Certainly a little different than if we show that to you at 5.30 or at 6.30. True view temperatures right now, 78 in Speedway, 77 in Martinsville. We'll back out and you can see some showers and thunder showers. Memphis to Nashville over to Charleston, West Virginia. It's the line to the northwest that we'll keep our eye on. May bring some showers tonight and it definitely marks a transition to cooler temperatures that will roll in here. So late tonight, and by late we're talking after midnight, some showers possible, maybe a rumble of thunder, much cooler for the rest of the week. Temperatures by Wednesday will struggle to reach 70 degrees. The humidity is dropping, and the low temperatures will drop into the 40s later in the week. Consider that compared to 64 this morning. If we get to the about 47 degree mark later in the week, that'll get your attention. It's 70 right now in Chicago, 81 in Lafayette. Temperatures are coolest to the north and east. Flying into the central U.S. we go, and you can see the line of showers and thunderstorms here. This is the line that marks a transition back to the cooler temperatures that sit in the northern plains. That Canadian high pressure will visit, and you can see what will happen. We'll dry out after some showers tonight. 73, partly sunny tomorrow. Temperatures will be in the upper 60s for a high Wednesday. We haven't been in the 60s for highs since the middle of May. Most of that forecast dry except for chance on Friday for some showers. Yeah. Otherwise, cooler than average, a nice break from the heat. What I call sweater weather. Huh? Cool and yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. Hey, speaking of that RV tour, we'll be right back with a look at what Trisha and I did for our first two weeks <laughs> here at RTV6. My toes were numb when I walked. My life.
welcome back, everyone. This may be our first day anchoring here at RTV6, but we have been very, very busy the last two weeks. Yeah, trust us. We <laughs> hopped in an RV and traveled all over central Indiana to see the sights and meet the great people of Indiana. Todd and Trisha on the road, but the great news for us is we're coming home, back to the station, finally, to stay around for a while. We wanted to give you all, though, a little look at some of the things that we've seen and experienced while we were out on the road. The Todd and Trisha tour is on the road. Here we come, Indiana. Yeah, yeah, well, welcome to our state. I'm glad you're doing this. You can, uh, it's a smart thing to do. You're going to learn a lot. We're at the city right. market on one of the hottest days. Hey, we've seen get some season. corn, too. And he's bought some corn. We are a family at Lowe's. We have always been a family. I want to see that left-handed uh, fastball. Let's, let's hope it gets across the plate. Woo! The Todd and Trisha tour of Indiana heads west. Hendricks County, that's where I live. And the newest members of the RTV6 family. From friendly folks in Avon and Plainfield to Greencastle's DePaul University. Liberal arts education really does leave you a pretty well-rounded person. <laughs> and our first trip to Gray's Cafeteria in Mooresville. Todd and Trisha heading north. On behalf of the Zionsville Merchants Association, thank you for coming to our community. Welcome to Lebanon. Glad to have you here. Todd and Trisha heading south and east. I'm Todd Wallace. Nice to see you. Thank you very much again for welcoming us, and uh, we can't wait to get started on the 10th. And we have a great team, and we're just really excited to get started. Let's go get them. Got it. <laughs> a lot of fun, and for more, go to ToddandTrisha.com. Yeah, you can read up on our backgrounds. I just wanted to say thanks to all of you for mm -hmm. greeting us, and thanks to Kevin and the team here for making us feel welcome. Thank you, Adam. We'll see you back here at 11 o'clock, everyone. Have a good evening. Join us downtown on Monument Circle November 23rd for the Circle of Lights performance. Auditions begin September 20th at the IBEW 481 and September 29th at the Electrical Training Institute. Call 594-0743.